Okay, limbic system, uh, the emotional brain. We're going to see that this is uh, the site for uh, uh, the action of many psychiatric drugs. And in particular, in the hypothalamus. I want to take just a moment to talk about this. And I know this is review <coughs> for most of you. But keep in mind, the hypothalamus plays a critical role. Let's see if I've got a slide here. No, I'm sorry, I don't. In, in regulating a lot of biological drives and rhythms. Y'all find, is, that, is this picture in your handout? No, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I don't know why, but anyway. Uh, the hypothalamus... Uh, regulates uh, appetite and sex drive it influences the circadian rhythm and and can have an effect on sleep and so a lot of the vegetative symptoms that you see with uh, with major depression are felt to be due to uh, inadequate functioning at the level of the hypothalamus okay Is this in your handout? Okay. <clears throat> okay, also uh, review, but I want to show you how a I want to show you how a pharmacologist might look at tackling brain related problems, okay? Now threat in the environment, of course, people can generate their own internal self-talk that creates anxiety. But let's talk about an external uh, stressor. Threat in the environment uh, is being uh, appraised at two levels in the brain: in the cortex and in the amygdala. And both of these brain areas, excuse me, both these brain areas independently evaluate potential danger in the environment. The big difference between them is that the cortex can do more precise reality testing where the amygdala it engages in very crude and primitive pattern recognition. So if something just even somewhat looks dangerous or smells dangerous because olfaction also is registered in the amygdala, uh, the amygdala can jump to a conclusion that they're in danger and set off a fight or flight response. It doesn't reality test. It doesn't stop to say, you know, wait just a minute. What's going on here? Uh, the amygdala is like a smoke detector. It is designed to respond to smoke. And the sensitivity level is set at the factory. And if it's not correct, then maybe, you know, you blow out a candle and it sets off the smoke alarm. It's way too sensitive. If it's not sensitive enough, your house can halfway burn down before it gets turned on. Uh, but eventually it goes off. And later, if we're talking about anxiety disorders, we'll talk about varying levels of sensitivity that can be influenced by life experiences and by genetics to determine uh, thresholds for picking up danger in the environment. Okay, but for right now, just to say briefly that we have two different information processing systems here, and and when they launch a fight or flight response, then they do it independent of one another. So, for instance, if my amygdala goes, oh, I'm in danger, but my cortex says, no, I, I'm not, I can still have some degree of anxiety response. And, and a lot of what cognitive therapy really is about, I mean, this is oversimplifying it, is basically saying, uh, hang on, get perspective here, get more data, do some critical thinking, get clear, and then override what's going, getting activated down at the level of the amygdala. Okay. When uh, uh, there's activation of these threat centers, then it, act, it sets off the fight or flight response. Now, it turns out that a number of the uh, psychiatric medications have a direct influence on the amygdala. Okay, and the specifics of this we'll come back to later. But the antidepressants, most of them, uh, tranquilizers, and also. Uh, anything that activates cannabinoid receptors, which include marijuana and hashish, okay, can, can reduce activation in the amygdala. So the pharmacologist might say, if this person is overreacting to things and has severe anxiety disorder, we might choose a drug that will actually adjust the, the 
degree of sensitivity at the level of the amygdala. All right. Now, uh, both the cortex and the amygdala uh, send down nerves, nerve axons to the locus ceruleus <coughs> that's in the brain stem. And locus ceruleus is this little tiny group of norepinephrine nerve cells. And the, the locus ceruleus cannot think. It just responds. So if it gets a danger signal from the cortex and or the amygdala, it'll launch a fight or flight response. Sometimes referred to as the adrenal gland of the brain. Once it gets activated, it will just spritz the entire brain with norepinephrine. Now, that does really two things. One is it, it kind of helps launch the fight or flight response in general. But the other thing, it brings the brain to a state of high alert. Now, they've actually done studies uh, with animals where they then planted an electrode in the locus ceruleus. <coughs> and under normal conditions, uh, you, the locus ceruleus, in sort of a pacemaker fashion, is activating the brain, <coughs> spritzing it with norepinephrine periodically. That's part of what keeps you awake, okay? And so if we implanted electrodes in your locus ceruleus, and I think we will be able to do that during lunchtime this afternoon. <laughs> okay. and, and, but if we were to do that this morning, then this is probably what it would sound like uh, coming out of your locus ceruleus. Keeping you awake, okay? Now, Two o'clock this afternoon, it would probably sound like this. <laughs> okay, now imagine you're in a uh, Psych 101 class, 300 people in the class, you're sitting in the back row, you're kind of scrunched down, nobody can see you. Two o'clock in the afternoon, extremely boring professor is up there, and you're about ready to slip into an irreversible coma. <laughs> And, and he's going on and on and on. And he goes, and then he points to you and says, what do you think about this? And all of a sudden, <laughs> okay, and that's exactly what happens. So if there's anything that, that is engaging, is, is important to pay attention to, you snap to in a state of high alertness. Okay. Now, we're going to cut, we're going to, there's this, there's this phrase called first pass effect. It's when drugs first go through your liver. And then they have second and third and fourth and subsequent. We're going to do first pass look at the locus ceruleus. And we'll come back and talk in greater detail about it later, especially when we talk about anxiety disorders. Okay. Now, uh, the message is coming from the cortex to the locus ceruleus. Uh, use the glutamate system. So it is squirting glutamate out here and turning on this norepinephrine nerve cell. From the amygdala, it is this molecule CRF. And we'll get into much more detail about CRF later. But here it's a neurotransmitter, and, uh, and it, the amygdala wakes up this norepinephrine system squirting that. Okay. Now, what this suggests is if you have too much activation, especially at the level of the amygdala, what if you had a drug that blocked CRF? Well, that might, might potentially be a good treatment for anxiety, and that's exactly what drug companies are looking at right now, are CRF blockers. Okay. But they're not available yet. <clears throat> now, keep, keep in mind that you probably have two or 3,000 receptors on the cell, so I'm just showing you the... the uh, classes of receptors here, okay? There are four major classes of inhibitory receptors, meaning you activate it and it shuts the cell down. All right, now first off is serotonin. And serotonin by and large is inhibitory uh, throughout the brain except in certain parts of the brain, remember I said one serotonin receptor is excitatory, okay? So uh, one way to calm down is to activate the serotonin receptors down here. The fastest way to do this is to exercise. Exercise, uh, and we're talking even uh, small amounts of exercise, 10 minutes 
of brisk walking or jogging will jack up dopamine and serotonin levels uh, enough that you can feel the difference. So when people are feeling extremely anxious, unfortunately what most human beings do, they get really anxious, they have a panic attack or they have OCD or, or whatever, uh, is they freeze. Okay, The best thing to do is to go jog. And, and almost w- without exception, excuse me, that will bring the level of anxiety down. It won't shut it off, but it'll be noticeable. And I might just say that that's a big deal for people who have anxiety disorders because they are chronically feeling out of control of their emotions. And when they can learn that within 10 minutes I can settle myself down at least a little bit, it gives it empowers them in some ways. <clears throat> the only reason not to do this is if there's some kind of very severe medical conditioning condition that you know you're not supposed to exercise, but. You know, most most of the time, uh, people have all kinds of medical problems can benefit from exercise. So, uh, that's a good fast approach. Okay, ultimately, the the increased serotonin in the in the brain in general with uh, antidepressants will have an effect here, but that's going to take longer to have an impact. Okay, opiate receptors <coughs> uh, they are naturally uh, produced by uh, the release of endorphins. And there's about, uh, was there a question back here? Uh, okay. There's a, a, a number of different endorphins. There's about 20 different endorphins. But uh, one thing that, that will activate the release of endorphins down in the brain stem uh, is rocking. And it's felt that the cerebellum in the back of the brain, which is very sensitive to movement in space and, and that sort of thing, when you rock like this or back and forth, uh, activates the release of endorphins that go directly into the brain stem. And uh, this is exactly why uh, a frantically upset crying baby can be soothed in a minute or two by rocking, is you're giving them a little shot of opiates down in their brain stem. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever gotten addicted to rocking, but, but, but also if you've run across people who've just had some horrible uh, trauma, uh, you know, you can sometimes see them rocking like that. Uh, you know, so rocking behavior is just a, a way to activate that. Of course, the fastest way to do this, I guess if somebody rocked you, that helps uh, quickly, but the most potent way to do it is to take heroin. Uh, or, or some kind of opiate, you know, a Vicodin or Oxycontin or something like this. <clears throat> now, I don't recommend that you suggest to your patients that they do this, uh, but some of them already do. And some people who are heroin addicts, uh, it's not just that they get a buzz off of this stuff, but also if you look at their, at their uh, history, They've been abused and neglected and and just put through the meat grinder. They're just horribly damaged people. And uh, some people believe that one reason this is their drug of choice is because it's the most potent way, really, to quiet down extremely severe anxiety. But it goes too far. Uh, Because if somebody is really stoned on heroin, you can run up to them and say, Hey, man, your house is on fire. Cool. <laughs> I mean, it over suppresses it, okay? Uh, all right, so now, now actually, what's interesting here is an experimental treatment that's been started using just recently, and that is to give uh, uh, combat uh, folks who've just encountered something absolutely horrific uh, one or two doses of morphine to, to get in there and really shut down. Uh, activity early, post-trauma, and then back off. And later when we talk about experimental treatments for PTSD, there are other ways to do this. Uh, But that's probably the most potent way. Now, you can't create an addiction, you know, in one dose or two doses, uh, but it may be something that's useful. So we'll talk more about that later. Okay. um, This is the alpha-2 adrenergic. Hang on just one moment here. Okay, I'm sorry, I was just checking to see about a slide that I wondered if I had put in there. Alpha-2 adrenergic receptor. Now, what happens here is that it naturally responds to norepinephrine. And, And there are 
now I didn't draw it on here but you have an axon coming out of this cell shooting way up into the brain okay from the brain stem but also there are what they call collateral axons and these are axons that come out here curl around and come back and make a synapse with its own receptor and so the minute let's say you almost had a car accident and you get whoa all of a sudden <gasps> like that uh, and it, but, but then you, you quickly discover no I'm okay I didn't actually have a crash uh, you get this explosion of, of nerve activity out of the locus ceruleus but because it's also coming back here and squirting itself here this particular uh, norepinephrine receptor is inhibitory so you turn on the brake and it calms it down now, if a lion's chasing you, you want to keep, you'll keep activating this. I mean, if, there's, if the, the stressor is ongoing, but if it's like you're out of danger, then the quicker you can shut things down, the better. So you see how this is one of those cool ways of self-regulating, okay? It also turns out that there are drugs that have been developed that uh, selectively bind to this receptor, and the one that's used the most is clonidine, it's used to treat high blood pressure, but also we'll see that it's used to treat some psychiatric conditions. And then finally, and we'll get into more detail with this later, is GABA benzodiazepine receptors. Remember, GABA uh, is, is found on more than 50% of uh, cells throughout the brain. So it's widely distributed. Uh, it's the major inhibitory neurotransmitting system in the brain. Okay. Uh, and, and, and several kinds of molecules can bind to it. GABA is, uh, is, is a close relative of, of an amino acid. It's not technically an amino acid, but almost. Uh, but it's made inside of the brain. And so uh, those people that are able to make more of this uh, then can activate this receptor and calm down the cell. I mean, one theory is that there are people that simply... Uh, are born into the world and they have more genes for making this molecule than others and they're more laid back and common and other people are more high strung okay but anyway that's the natural way to do it the other way to do it is to eat certain things like uh, benzodiazepines these are the tranquilizers uh, like Valium and Xanax and so forth and they also they they bind to a, a different receptor but it's in a complex with GABA and it really causes the, the cell to quiet down. <coughs> Alcohol binds to the exact same receptor. Okay, There's another receptor uh, that where barbiturates bind. So you have a number of different receptors in a receptor complex uh, where there are different molecules then that can shut this down. Now, l let me emphasize something, and that is if you, uh, if you take four milligrams of Xanax or drink a six-pack of beer, uh, guess what? You're going to probably go to sleep uh, because it's not just affecting stuff in the locus ceruleus, but it's widespread throughout the brain, and it shuts down the cortex, and therefore you have central nervous system depression. So if you're getting ready to take your licensing exam, it's probably not a good idea to take lots of tranquilizers. I mean, you'll be very mellow, but you can't use your cortex. And oftentimes that's an important thing to have available during the licensing exam, okay? If you happen to take a, a barbiturate, like phenobarbital, and you decide to drink a six-pack of beer, that you're going to really get relaxed. In fact, it's going to relax parts of the, of the brain stem that regulate respiration, you'll stop breathing and it will kill you. Okay, So this is a, a potentially problematic receptor complex. But I'm, I'm setting the stage here for later when we talk about different pharmacologic approaches. Because here's, here's the story. Okay, Let's go back a couple of slides here. One thing you can do, again, just looking at this through this very narrow lens of drug interventions, okay? Lots of different ways to change the brain. Is using drugs that reduce uh, the sensitivity level at the information processing level in the brain, okay? 
The next thing is uh, to that you could say, okay, another strategy is we can come down here, and regardless of what's going on up here, we can just uh, you know try to dampen down activity in the locus ceruleus. And there are a number of drugs, some used in psychiatry, that do that. All right. Now th- this. <coughs> You don't need to memorize this, but I, I just, just I want to give you an example about the complexity of this. Okay, the serotonin system, uh, like a number of these neurotransmitter systems, uh, has its origins mainly down in the brainstem, and here's where you have the cell bodies. But then they send projections up into many parts of the brain, and, and so when you increase serotonin. Uh, even though it's, it's being manufactured down here, it's going into many parts of the brain. Uh, it, there are projections up to the amygdala, which dampen it so you're not as, a sen- not as sensitive. There are receptors up in the hypothalamus, which potentially can influence things like sleep and appetite. And also... It projects to the locus ceruleus to dampen that down. So there are multiple sites then where serotonin can make a big difference. And down here it's inhibitory. Guess what? In the prefrontal cortex, serotonin is excitatory. And there are some conditions, in particular impulse control disorders, that have decreased serotonin activity in the frontal lobes. Okay, So just to try to give you a glimpse about the, the complexity of this. And, and, and you know, here, here's the deal. These drug companies, uh, for marketing reasons, uh, call, call their drugs things like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. And it's true. The, the drug actually operates on a particular part of the nervous system, okay, uh, the serotonin re- reuptake uh, transporters. But the brain is like an ecosystem, and if you monkey around with the, something over here, it's going to have widespread effects. There is just no way in the world that you can target a drug into the nervous system without it setting off a cascade of reactions. And you know, like in, in any ecosystem, if you like go in and you kill off a certain animal there, like a particular fly or mosquito or something like that, then you, you get this ripple effect. It throws all things off. And, and so the drug companies, it sounds nice to make it sound like it's so selective, but the actual effects are widespread and they're very complex. Okay. Okay. Top-down control means a higher brain area controls a lower brain area. And a lot of the psychiatric drugs, that's what they do. They activate higher up, higher order brain areas. Lots of times these are frontal lobe brain structures. Get them to work more effectively and therefore have control over what's happening at more primitive levels of the brain. Like for instance, I don't have it on the diagram here, but there's a part of of the frontal lobes that directly regulates activity in the amygdala and, and, and if you can increase the activity in that brain structure it can exercise top down control and significantly dampen uh, activity in the amygdala and, what the, and, and then what people will experience then after uh, usually after about four weeks of treatment is that they are not getting as upset about stuff they're not worrying about stuff as much they become less uh, sensitive less overly reactive 